Hi, I'm Max Kaiser. This is the Kaiser Report. Yeah, Bitcoin is skyrocketing up the charts, heading into the five-figure tens of thousands, soon to be hundreds of thousands of dollars. A lot of stories emerging. You know, Stacy, it's amazing going back to the 2011 era when Bitcoin was a dollar, two dollars, three dollars. Of course, we were reporting it here on the Kaiser Report. A lot of people would give me Bitcoins at these conferences. I gave a lot of people a lots of Bitcoins. I distinctly remember giving Russell Brand a thousand Bitcoins when they were, I think, maybe two bucks a Bitcoin. That's now worth uh, $16 million. I wonder if he still has them. Some of them were or these uh, cassatious coins and um, I don't you know it's just it lost track it's like giving away candy at that time and uh, now of course uh, they're worth something yeah we're going to as we approach the end of the year and do our retrospectives and look forward to the new year we're going to talk a lot about the history of Bitcoin and what's going on um, we are recording this uh, quite a, a few hours before the futures markets open in Chicago uh, so Bitcoin has become a huge, massive international story. Everybody's hearing about it. We're getting a lot of tweets and a lot of emails asking how to buy it, how to buy it. People are panic buying. And you're certainly seeing that. I saw a chart of buys versus sells, and it's all buys, no selling. There's nobody selling. Uh, so you're seeing quite a, a, a basically a melt up and then a uh, roller coaster down in, you know, so it's very volatile. We're going to see a lot of volatility in Bitcoin prices as these futures markets unfold. There's going to be multiple futures contracts, multiple banks. All these banks are getting into it. Um, we are, again, recording this right before the futures markets open in Chicago. So what's your prediction? By the time this airs, it will have already happened. What's your prediction for how it will have impacted the price, if anything, on um, late Sunday, early Monday. I think we're going to see upward trend because the business of futures trading needs at their core a lot of inventory of coins. So that I think, as I've been saying, uh, get an inventory of coins on the books uh, so that specialists and market makers can do their job in creating a price structure and price discovery, but you need to have an inventory to do that. Remember, I invented the virtual specialist technology, patent number 5950176. I have designed trading technologies and specialist technologies going back to 1997. And before that, I was a trader on Wall Street, traded options. I was the third biggest options producer in the Shearson-Lehman Hutton system for many years. And uh, so now they're coming into my you know, my territory. So now. tell us, what Bitcoin's do you think the coming impact? Into my house. So what do you think the futures market is? A lot of people are from the precious metals market who have been watching our show. And what they always say is that the futures markets, the paper markets have driven down the price of gold and silver. What do you think is going to have an impact or not on Bitcoin? See, what's happening in gold and silver is that capital is fleeing gold and silver and going into Bitcoin. Capital is fleeing fiat money going into Bitcoin. Capital is fleeing all these other debt asset ridden classes. asset classes and into this new emerging asset class. And therefore, they've got this upward buying pressure. People don't understand that at its heart, Bitcoin is a messaging app first, a means of, no, a store of value second and a medium of exchange third. The Satoshi white paper is a bit misleading because it, it leads off by calling Bitcoin digital cash. That's kind of misleading. It's not really digital cash until first it establishes itself as a messaging app. Money and economics are the history of communication and trade in language. That's language explodes onto the scene. Um, trade explodes onto the scene. Messaging apps explode and exponentially onto the scene. Bitcoin is similarly. It's unique in this way. It's an emerging asset class. It's not quite a currency. It's not quite a commodity. It's not quite a technology. It's a combination of all these things happening in this beautifully Cartesian, elegant distribution of interests called the Bitcoin protocol. And it's eating the fiat world, eating the commodity world, eating the technology world. And it's going to 100,000, 200,000, 300,000 a coin because there are, listen to what you got to do. Instead of saying, what's Bitcoin in relation to gold? In other words, if it trades at $400,000 a coin, it would be roughly equivalent to the total above ground gold stock in the world. You have to look at it in terms of Bitcoin as related to global debt. It's not $7 trillion in debt, like $7 trillion in gold. There's $300 trillion in debt. I did the calculations, and that would imply a Bitcoin price of over $2 million a coin to monetize that debt and to get okay, rid of that okay, debt. Okay, we're going well, really why, fast. Why are we going too uh, fast? Yeah, yeah, we're and going this really is the revolution. <laughs> the, the Earth spins, fly, we're flying through space at hundreds of thousands of miles per second. Why do we, you know, light, it's the speed of light. You know, how can we discount that? How can we belittle that? If okay. we put a man on the moon, we can put Bitcoin to a million.
Okay, as you said, many people call Bitcoin gold 2.0. If just as that, just as operating as a gold, you know, proxy or gold of its own, a digital gold, as uh, Bitcoin investor Novogratz has said, that would equal $400,000 per Bitcoin, just to equal the size of the gold market, which is over $7 trillion. Uh, no, Bitcoin. We made that point years ago, but continue. Yes, this is what he determined the price would be, is for exactly $400,000. He watches our price. show, I get it. Okay. I'm still asking you, however, what do you think the Chicago futures markets, we have CBOE the, uh, on Sunday and then right after CME, and then there are going to be NASDAQ, uh, Cantor Fitzgerald, who you sold your technology to, your, your company to at Hollywood Stock Exchange. What do you think the impact will be on the price? Can they, will it provide more liquidity? Will it bring in more money? Will it uh, cause more volatility? Will it provide less volatility? What do you think will happen? It'll create a bigger pipe for more money to flow into Bitcoin. Right now, the pipe is about, you know, like this. It's mm. a relatively minuscule market compared to the bond futures, the currency futures, stock futures. You know, $5 trillion worth of Forex per day is the market. Bitcoin in that arena is a pipsqueak. By expanding these contracts, futures contracts, derivatives, and bringing Wall Street and Chicago into the mix, you're taking that small straw, which is an on-ramp for fiat, into Bitcoin, and you're making it massively bigger. And that on-ramp is going to suck in what I call the Bitcoin black hole. It'll suck every piece of fiat, debt-ridden, carcinogenic, bull, hooky, central bank, Wall Street Bank, Jamie Dimon will be sucked through a straw. I mean, imagine Jamie Dimon being sucked through a straw. Would he end up on the other end is a pulp of snot and degenerate, uh, you know. Derivatives. Derivatives. <laughs> imagine Lloyd Blankfein being sucked through a garden hose. What ends up on the other? It's a string theory. I mean, it's the black, the Bitcoin black hole. You know, if you enter a black hole, you get stringified. Spaghettified. You get spaghettified. Imagine Jamie Dimon and Lauren Blankfein being spaghettified as they're sucked into the Bitcoin black hole and they just turn into, you know, atomized pieces of deceit in the Hamptons looking for Matt Lauer and some underage chick. You mentioned the size of the Forex market and that's foreign currency exchange, the foreign exchange markets. So all that's the biggest market in the world probably by trade volume per day, five trillion a day, dollars versus euro versus yen versus, uh, you know, British pound. I forgot the name of that little country there. <laughs> oh, that's that appendix, that appendage on the end of Europe, that stub run by so, Theresa May. So that's five trillion dollars a day. One, the very, very first big day as everybody was preparing for these, uh, uh, the futures markets to open on Bitcoin, they, we saw 28.7 billion in Bitcoin volume. That had, that was up from like five and a half billion over the summer. So now we're at 28.7 billion, but just a tiny, 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 blip compared to the whole forex market of five trillion dollars a day yeah that's what i'm saying it, 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 but but so is it the overwhelming see this is what people don't understand is that at its heart bitcoin is a messaging app first store of value second and a medium of exchange third as a messaging app this is the history of economics the history of money the history of trade the history of d evolution the dna in our cells of our bodies suggests that bitcoin will be a lot higher because we as a species want to connect and it's monetization of our unconscious. It's the monetization of our collective unconscious. It's, the monet it's what I call the psychic equity conversion, the PEC. We're converting our, our, our consciousness and unconsciousness into a monetary medium of exchange through the, the magic, if you will, as Steve Jobs would call it, of a messaging app, the Metcalf's law of exponential growth, and uh, essentially Thayer's law, if you want to talk about economics, for all you economic quants and dweebs and hacks out there, look up Thayer's law, T-H-I-E-R-S law of good money pushing out bad, okay? The fiat money is going the way of the dodo. This brings me towards the end of our show, the last two or three minutes here. Before we go into the second half, we had finished your second part of your interview with Randy Voller. I do want to say Max will probably be on RT, uh, you know, talking live as these uh, Bitcoin futures 
uh, start trading. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, or other news. Exciting. Well, hopefully or probably uh, you're going to basically see a lot of live news about the futures markets because it's going to be a big impact and it's a big news and it's a big story. But before that, I want to turn to an interesting story that also happened on the very day that everybody, the market started going wild and Bitcoin futures, up, uh, you know, Bitcoin prices up at 5,000, down 3,000, up 6,000, down 2,000 when it was very volatile. It was emerged that Saudi crown prince is buyer of Da Vinci painting that sold for a record-breaking $450 million, says Wall Street Journal. They got this information from the U.S. intelligence community that it was the Saudi crown prince, the same guy um, <laughs> incarcerating those hundreds of princes. And you had to pay for the painting somehow. <laughs> exactly. But, you know, this is very old school, old world. Everybody's like, wow, that's the crown prince. This is $450 million for a Da Vinci painting. Just to put that into context, that's, uh, that is three Bitcoin pizzas at uh, this, the current prices. That's three Bitcoin pizzas. Remember, 10,000 Bitcoin were spent for two pizzas at the very first ever Bitcoin meetup right here in New York back in 2011. Only two or three weeks later, there was that Prague Bitcoin conference where you and I attended. But that was just a mere three Bitcoin pizzas <laughs> for this Da Vinci painting. <laughs> yeah, well, absolutely. And, uh, you know, the entire market cap of cryptocurrencies is about $450 billion now approaching the half a trillion mark. Cryptocurrency market will, of course, top the trillion dollar level and hit the multi-trillion dollar level, again, because it's this amazing uh, quantum effect of pulling in all the fiat money into the, into the crypto and Bitcoin black hole of store of value. You used to be the only person calling for, uh, I remember there's some headlines back from 2012 or whatever, Max Kaiser says Bitcoin market will go to 100 billion. How wacky, how crazy. But now I tune into the news or I read the headlines and it's nonstop, all sorts of names. This guy says it's going 400,000, 4 billion, 4 trillion. Everybody's like calling this. Well, yeah, out, like out, Al, do you? Alan Greenspan was talking about uh, Bitcoin in terms of the continental, which is the, yeah, I gotta go. All right, well, <laughs> stay tuned for the second half. A lot more coming your way. Even George Galloway. I gave George Galloway free Bitcoins like in 2011. He's a millionaire, multi-millionaire, George. Do you know that? Stay tuned. Hi, I'm Max Kaiser. This is still the Kaiser Report. You know, I felt bad cutting Randy Voller off last time he was on, right, when we were talking about free speech. So it's my freaking show, so I make all the executive decisions, so we're having him back on, right? Hey, great to be back. All right. First Amendment. Yeah, let's get into it. Randy Voller, if you were still officially advising the Democratic Party, how can they retake North Carolina in 2020? Well, first of all, you know, we got to put good candidates on the ballot, and you've got to run someone in every race. One of the past problems has been a failure to run candidates in all 120 legislative races, Max. Where do you find these good candidates? Like, uh, the Democrats seem to be obsessed with chasing the Russian hoax ghost. Like, they don't realize that dog don't hunt, to use a Southern expression. Well, that, that really has no bearing on what's going on in local, regional, and state races. What they need to do is focus on candidates that connect with their district, but you and I have talked a lot about gerrymandering. Yeah, tell the people about that. Well, gerrymandering is the ability for a general assembly, a legislature, uh, to draw the lines after a census uh, for the districts. And so what's happened, and there have been numerous court cases in North Carolina, is the, the lines have been drawn where the politicians are essentially selecting the voter and not the other way around. You know, you know, people will say to me, well, Randy, you know, you're partisan. You're arguing now that you're out of power. We're in power, the Republicans. Give us our time. And I say, look, if, you're, if your values and your ideas and what you believe actually, you know, can, you know, are worth something, then just make all the districts equivalent and let the chips fall as they may, meaning that they're you know, 50-50 races. If our ideas aren't any good, the voters won't vote for us. But right now you have legislative and congressional districts that are way out of balance. For instance, if you have a D next to your name in some districts, you're going to win, no matter who you are, and same with an R. And frankly, that's just un-American. It's not fair. It's not right. You said something there that is really good. Uh, well said. You said that instead of people choosing their politicians, the politicians are choosing their voters. Yes. 
In other words, to gerrymandering. They get together in a room and they say, if we divide up the voting blocks in this way, we know, based on demographics and psychographics, that we'll get X number of votes. And that's, it's vote rigging. So again, you know, this Russiagate hoax is all about fake vote influenced by a foreign entity, and yet gerrymandering is a clear-cut example of vote rigging right here. It's happening all over America. It's especially egregious here in North Carolina. Why don't they address that if they're so concerned about vote rigging? Because people, when they get into the power, they want to preserve uh, their grip on power. Right now, North Carolina is a purple state. It's roughly a 50-50 state. We've got 13 members of Congress. It's 10 Republicans and three Democrats. It should really be seven Republicans and six Democrats or seven Democrats and six Republicans. Right there, you can see how egregious it is. Go to other states like Pennsylvania and you'll see the same effect. These districts have been drawn in a way where the politicians are picking the voters. With technology as it is now, you can literally draw a line right through a bedroom. And if the husband votes Republican and the wife Democrat, that's what you get. Now, it's not said, fair. You've said in the past that North Carolina is really a petri dish of the American political landscape it as is. a whole. And you have, for example, the wealth and income divide, I believe, is very sharply expressed to the largest degree of any city in America in Charlotte, right? You've yeah, if you, if you look at the indices that, that talk about social mobility, we've got a couple areas in the state that are at the top of a very bad chart. You know, you, you mentioned Mecklenburg, Charlotte, also I think Greensboro, the Greensboro, Winston-Salem area are both areas where social mobility is particularly tricky. Now, you know, it doesn't take a, a genius to figure out that industry was wiped out uh, in this state. Uh, first, you had the Civil War yes. that just decimated uh, much of what was happening here. Decimated wealth. Most of the wealth was actually in property. And what was the private property? Slaves. Right. It went off the books. And then you had the rise of some corporate indus industry with tobacco, agriculture, sweet potatoes. Number one sweet potato producer in America is North Carolina. Agriculture, I think, is $83 billion a year in exports. Don't quote me on that, but I think I saw that number while I was watching the local news over Thanksgiving. And uh, what other, uh, some of the other dynamics that are a part of North Carolina, as you see it, from your perch as a political man. Well, we, we, we lost textiles, we lost furniture making, we lost a lot of industries that were outsourced uh, overseas, whether they went to, to Mexico or whether they went to Southeast Asia. And that really gutted parts of the state uh, that were dependent on those good manufacturing jobs. And of course, when big tobacco went down, we lost that too. I mean, we're in Durham. Durham was built by big tobacco. Duke University was built by Big Tobacco. People don't want to actually square that circle, but that's the truth. Uh, Randy, the millennial Democrats have a radically different ethos to the baby boomer Democrats. They do. Uh, far more left-wing and far less suburban and more smart city, foodie-loving, hipster localism. As a mayor, former mayor, how do you attract this new generation? Well, generally, millennials are, are interested in a sense of place. They're interested in locality. So, you know, um, farm to fork type of things, or some people say, you know, tied to table, you know, locally sourced fish instead of getting it from a, a salmon farm. And it, it's about quality of life. It's about creating uh, experiences as opposed to living in McMansions. I think we're going to have a real tricky thing in our country as the baby boomers are downsizing and trying to offload some of these McMansions that were built in the 80s and 90s that were not very energy efficient. Who are the buyers going to be? I it's going to be what a, the, interesting. They got here that I love are trout. Right. With, with pecans. That's good. Really good. Let me ask you another question. So the corporate Democratic Party is claiming uh, victory with the recent Virginia elections, but many of the winners were Bernie style. Right. Uh, are, are the millennials well and truly going to end the reign of the neoliberal Democrats like uh, Hillary? Well, I think the reign of, cent of centuries and neoliberalism is already on its way out. I mean, sometimes the patient doesn't know it's dead yet. Really? You think that Hillary is dead? Well, you know, haven't you seen a body in rigor mortis can still kick? So it seems as though we are in a post-Clinton era. 
I think we're moving, especially with the issues with uh, sexual uh, harassment and the scandals, we're moving into a post-era for an awful lot of that generation, not only in the Republican Party, but the Democratic Party as well. We're, you know, I, I'm saying 2018 is going to be the year of the woman. There are going to be a lot of incredible women on the ballot, and I think that women are going to play a role at the polls and, and reshape this country. State wait, no, wait, state. Wait, we've seen evidence of this already. We have. There is a huge, you can almost call it a tsunami, of women participating in politics as a result, in part, due to this wave of sexual scandals. Women yes. are saying, I've, I've had it, enough, this is our opportunity. Everyone's speaking up finally, we have unity. The problem with the uh, women's rights movement in the past is that you didn't have enough unity. There was always no. some shiksa ready to sell out her sister to become a supermodel. But now there's so much sexual perversion out there, particularly in Hollywood, uh, that uh, there's a unity. With, with not since not since the suffrage movement, you know, rights for women to vote. Have we seen such unity? No more rape. No more Harvey Weinstein's. And this is going to create a wave of political activism and females in politics, Randy. Well, I mean, you're seeing it by the election of Donald Trump. I mean, had Hillary won, I don't think you would have seen uh, such a a virulent backlash, but I mean, his victory with his baggage connected to the other issues that you bring up. I mean, Weinstein obviously was a big player in, in, in the Democratic Party as far as a donor, and all these others across these industries are being exposed. And, and women are saying, it's our time. We're, we're tired of hitting the glass ceiling. We're tired of, you know, pay in, inequality. Uh, we're tired of being a single mom trying to make it on two and three jobs and, and having a, a master's degree and not being paid. I see it showing up at the ballot box. And, and, and I applaud that. Well, yeah, I, I, I mean, yeah. the men have had the ball for a long time. It's time to give it to the women. It, it's time to see, uh, you know, what women can do or from the local to the state. Anatomically to correct. The men have had for quite some time. It's time to give those to the women. It's time to let the women get their share of the power, because we certainly have made a fine mess of things. Absolutely. And it can't be worse than it already is. No, it can't. You know, we've st and we're entering an age in the economy that demands less actual physical strength because everything is digital. So it's more about thinking of the cloud, cloud thinking. Women are good in the cloud. They don't have the whole sense of thinking. linear thinking. Like women can't really think linearly. You know, they'll show up at the, uh, you never notice this, at a toll booth, and they don't actually look for the change to pay the toll until they arrive at the toll booth. I mean, for a man, that's very frustrating. But for a woman, that's the way they think. But I think now is the time to let that kind of thinking take over. When I first got into politics, I was the youngest on my board at age 36. And everyone, I think, at the time was between ages 50 and 80. But there, were only, there was only one woman. It was an African-American woman. And I helped elect her, the first African-American woman ever in the history of Pittsburgh. And that town is almost 240 years old. As I moved on in my career and got more women elected to the board, you could see a difference in policy. So having an equality of people on these decision-making boards across the country is important. You can't have it all one gender or one class. It's important to have people from different areas to provide insight in your community. And I see that happening in 2018, 2019, and 2020. And you already saw it in Virginia in 2017. More women on top. That's what I say. More women. All right, we got to go. Randy, that's going to do it for this edition. For the Kaiser Report with me, Max Kaiser, and Stacey Herbert, I'd like to thank our guest, Randy Voller. If you want to catch us on Twitter, it's Kaiser Report. Until next time, bye, y'all.